Hi, hello all, welcome back. Where we left off last time, I'd made an early Regency gown, but I still needed to make some accessories to turn it into a functional Regency ensemble for like promenading, uh, going to balls, uh, doing Regency stuff. This video is going to be kind of light on the history and heavier on the cranking out Regency accessories. So if you're here for cool facts, sorry. Uh, if you're here to see me make a bunch of haphazard sewing projects, Alright, so what kind of accessories does a fancy Regency lady need? The Regency coincided with the birth of globally integrated industrial capitalism, and that had pretty big knock-on effects for fashion and everything else. Uh, the late 1700s and early 1800s saw a big reduction in the cost of cotton textiles, the growth of a bourgeois capitalist class of consumers, and the shifting of the nucleus of upper-class taste away from royal courts and toward these uh, rich industrialist bourgeois circles. And there is also the rise of Romanticism, a cultural movement that encouraged the expression of individuality through dress, and a movement which was in some ways really a reaction to this new economy. This all led to a huge proliferation in the amount of fashion items bought and sold and created, um, as well as trends in these items and especially in accessories. Generally, these items and the gowns themselves tend to get bigger, wackier, and more structured in the 1810s, but in the first decade of the 1800s, they're a bit more relaxed, though like still weird. I was aiming for like an 1805 date for my ensemble, so more of like this sort of territory. There were, of course, different norms of dress for different occasions and different classes of people, I'm going for walking or promenading daytime attire for a fancy rich lady in England. Uh, in other words, something that would be super at home in a Jane Austen novel, but not something everyone would have worn on like a Tuesday. For this look, I will need a reticule, a chemisette, gloves, a bonnet, a shawl or cape or something like that, and a petticoat, which is an undergarment rather than an accessory, uh, but can be an accessory in this period, kind of. Uh, but I don't have one, so I need to make one. Reticules are little handbags that grew in popularity during the Regency, probably because the light flowing dresses made carrying bulky pockets under your skirts awkward, but also probably because they just loved an accessory in this period. They're often this sort of coffin shape and have a lot of tassels coming off them. So with these two general rules in mind, uh, I just improvised the rest. So to start, I embroidered some designs for the front and back panels onto a scrap of velveteen. I cut these out in a coffin shape that I swear I carefully drew out beforehand. How do I do things like this to myself? But I had to clean it up a bit. Okay, that'll still fit. I cut some narrower coffin shapes for the sides out of a silk satin and tried to sew it all up right sides together, doing the thing where you rush through something without taking the time to carefully pin it, uh, and then it just all ends up way too wonky. I've done a very bad job. It's not so- oh. Oh yeah, that's pretty bad. And then you have to do it a totally different way that takes way more time than just doing it carefully the first go round. That will be a theme in this project. So I sewed a tiny hem around the perimeter to keep it from fraying and cut new side pieces, this time in skinny triangles, and then I sewed them together in this weird time-consuming way, uh, but I didn't film that, uh, but this is what it looked like. I saw some originals that had whipped edges that looked really nice, and I tried to do that, but it looks very sloppy, um, and it took forever. I think probably what I needed to do was add a piece of cording to the edge, something a bit thicker to whip over that uh, to create a more, more defined seam thing. Also I added tassels. Uh, they're great, they're fun, uh, I didn't film these so I, I will now film making a tassel and show it to you. 
loop a bunch of yarn or cord or whatever around something that is about two and a half times as long as you want your finished tassel to be. Get some string that you want your tassel to dangle from and tie that to the center of your bundle, leaving a long tail if you want your tassel to be all the same color. Push the loop ends up and use that tail you left to tie tightly above the original knot, making sure the yarns are evenly spread out around the center string. And then push the loop ends down and wrap the tail yarn around the whole thing a bunch of times below the knot. Then thread the yarn into the center so you can tie a knot where it won't be seen. Cut the dangling loops and even it out, and voila, a tassel. Hope you were taking notes. I couldn't find a fancy enough drawstring, so I made one using the finger looping method, and I added some beefy tassels to either end of it. Now I had a drawstring with giant, beautiful tassels on either end, and I realized that might make it hard to get the drawstring through any sort of drawstring casing. So rather than remaking my beautiful cord and tassels, I figured out a clever workaround. I cut a small opening in the front uh, and a larger one in the back, then worked the edges of these openings in a buttonhole stitch. Then I sewed on my lining, it's just a similar shaped bag thrown together on the machine, and I'm back stitching it uh, above the holes right sides together and leaving a little gap for me to turn it inside out. I stuffed the cord into the front opening and then pushed it through to the back opening and worked a little bar here to separate the two sides of the opening so that the cord can't accidentally be pulled back through. This was just done by fixing some thread to the top and bottom of the hole and then working it over with a buttonhole stitch to beef it up a bit. Then I pushed the lining back in and got the cord all where I wanted it, and I added a line of stitching through the bag and the lining to make a casing for the drawstring so it stays put at the top there. And finally, I needed to close up the little opening I left when I sewed the lining to the bag, and I did that with a slip stitch. I love the color scheme I picked for the embroidery, I like the tassels, I like the fabric. It's altogether a little bit sloppy, but uh, it's done. Gloves. Long gloves are an iconic part of Regency fashion. For daytime, they're generally above the elbow, sometimes they're made out of leather in white, buff, or even green. And I'm gonna make mine out of white cotton, that was totally a thing. Uh, probably not as popular as leather, but I don't know how to make gloves, so I'd rather waste a bunch of cotton than a bunch of leather. I started with an extreme act of hubris, and I did not read or watch a single thing about how to make gloves. I think I just looked at some Regency gloves, Google searched glove pattern maybe, to get the general vibe, and then I just went for it. They're not too bad. They're pretty good but I noted some places where like the finger slits need to come down a little bit lower and the uh, hole needs to move in a little bit. So I noted those on the pattern, redrew another pattern with some slight differences and then I cut that bad boy out last night, except I left the fingers all long and dangly so I can just sort of leave them open at the very tip and close them off, like measured to my actual little fingers to keep things maybe easier. We'll see. I sewed these up on the machine and I was really struggling to keep the seam allowances as small as they needed to be. That all added up and they are too small. <laughs> So take three. My previous pattern was a bit approximate, but this time I was measuring everything down to the last millimeter, and this time I hand stitched them so that I could get everything exactly perfect. They don't fit. <laughs> So we're gonna put glove making away for a while and head on over to chemisettes. Chemisettes were little tucker things one would wear to fill in the neckline of a gown. 
They were both for style and for sun protection, and I've heard different things from different people about whether or not modesty played into it too. A common misunderstanding about the past is that all old-timey people just preferred to keep as many inches of a woman's body covered as much as possible. An ankle or collarbone shown, that was just obscene nudity. And like, yes, a knee was probably more titillating to someone from the Middle Ages to like 1950 than to us today, but skirt and sleeve lengths and other things like this, they varied a lot depending on what you were doing and what class you belonged to. In fact, it's probably more common to find people criticized for being dressed too expensively rather than for bearing too much skin. Very much the vibe of like an old guy going out today and seeing a bunch of ladies standing outside of a club in short skirts and going, oh, aren't you cold? Ooh. For whatever reason, the chemisette was a thing in the Regency period, and it went through many different trendy iterations. Uh, I picked a pattern from Janet Arnold's Patterns of Fashion. This book gives pattern shapes of real, historical garments in museums, but it doesn't give much guidance in terms of how to put these things together. So just up top I'm gonna say if you're actually making this, don't do it how I did it, and instead do it this way. Probably makes more sense. Anyway, here's how I did it. As I said, the pattern I used for this is taken from an extant historical garment. So one garment made to fit one specific person, chances are it's not gonna fit me. I mocked up the body panels and it indeed did not fit. The size wasn't the issue, but the shape was really weird. The shoulders just did not fit me. Rather than fiddle with the mock-up until it fit me, I decided to come at it from the other direction and draft something based off of my bodice blocks. Connecting the shoulders of my blocks together, I traced out the shape of the center front, center back, and neckline, and cut this out to get a basic Lydia's shoulder-shaped thing. And then I laid that over the original pattern and traced here, averaged there, zhuzhed here, uh, so that the seam and hem placements more or less follow the original pattern, but the whole shape is fit to my body. So I cut this out, tested that it fit, and was ready to get going. I bought some brand new sheer cotton batiste for this because I wanted it to be fancy. The pattern calls for three long strips to make the rough tiers around the neck, but I decided two would be enough for me. I cut them out with the length specified in the pattern, but made them a bit wider because I wanted more pizzazz. This was a mistake for reasons I'll discuss later. Then I hemmed the outside of these strips with a rolled hem. There are two ways to hand stitch a rolled hem, and here I'm doing it the easy way. I'm rolling the hem toward me, then just like for a normal hem stitch, I'm picking up a bit of the main fabric and then a bit of the hem and then just pulling the needle through. If I was better at sewing, I might be tensioning it between the fingers of my left hand, but that's hard, so instead I'm repeatedly stitching into my finger. Moving on to the body pieces, I sewed the shoulder seams together doing a weird improvised overlappy thing to enclose the seam allowance. I then hemmed the sides and the center front with more rolled hems. Paying attention to what I'm doing, watching Starship Troopers. A drawstring was fixed to the bottom of the back panel, and the front of the bottom edges were double folded over the drawstring and fixed in place with a hem stitch. This created a casing for the drawstring to move in. Next, I had to attach these long, roughly neck bits to the body, which meant that they needed to be pleated. The original has mushroom pleats. I'm not 100% sure what mushroom pleats are, but I think they're basically just like a eh, 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 like a zigzag, like a cartridge pleat. So with cartridge pleats, you would do two lines of stitching that are exactly even so that when you pull the gathering together, you get that going all the way along your fabric. However, I don't think that that is how these mushroom pleats would have been made. You just, there isn't really any way to iron that so that it gets that really sharp edge like mushroom pleats seem to have. So I think instead I'm gonna go for something a bit more like wibbly wobbly. I have really dirty fingernails. I always have dirty fingernails. I decided on rolled whipped gathers. 
Taking the unfinished edge that I wanted to work the gathers into, I rolled it toward me just like for the rolled hem. I then whip stitched around the hem, and every eight stitches or so, I pulled it tight. Roll, whip, gather. After the gathering was done, I cut a piece of twill tape about the circumference of my neck, then covered that with a piece of cotton batiste, then whip stitched the ruffle to the tape and the batiste, making sure to go through every single gather. So Janet Arnold doesn't really say how everything goes together. What I feel confident of is that the chemise that needs to be attached to the tape. Maybe I'll do that first and then this will just get tacked down to cover up the tape and this will get sewn on top. Here I'm stay stitching the neck of the chemisette with just a running back stitch. This prevents the neck from stretching out while I'm sewing the tape to it. I ended up sandwiching the body of the chemisette in between the neck tape and the batiste flap, folding under the edge of the batiste and then fixing it all with a whip stitch. This could have been so much easier if I hadn't sewn on the ruffle already. There was a lot of wrangling and a lot of pins. At this point, I made a cute little braid and some tassels out of embroidery thread, uh, making full use of my newly acquired tassel making skills. I stitched this to either side of the neck tape and just tried to do my best to kind of make the front look somewhat tidy somehow. Finally, I'm whipping on the other tier of ruffles to the neck tape, making sure to grab through the batiste and into the tape, and keeping my stitches fairly taut so that the ruffle stands out a bit rather than just being floppy. And here she is. You will never, ever see this level of detail and fiddly hand sewing from me ever again. This video is too long, so I'm going to cut it right there. More will come next week. Will I finish these gloves? Will I make a bonnet? Ah, cliffhanger. But while I have your attention, I want to talk a bit about what's happening in Gaza because I think it's horrific and I think not everyone appreciates the extent of US involvement and um, how serious it is. Um, I would like to spill my heart out about colonialism and apartheid, but I know that right now that is gonna make people put up a reflexive wall and say, oh, that is just your lefty bleeding heart position. So instead, I'm gonna share some facts that I think are easier to agree on. Some geographic context, US involvement, the scale of destruction, and a war crimes 101. Okay, so first, the Gaza Strip is a tiny piece of land. It's about the size of a large city. 2.2 million people live there. 60-something percent of them are UN-registered refugees from the 1948 war. And there's a big wall around it. So when you hear that Israel dropped 6,000 bombs on the Gaza Strip in the first week of the war, you can picture that happening in a city where real people really live. So America is very involved. Every year, America sends $3.8 billion in military aid to Israel. Uh, in light of this conflict, America has sent $14.3 billion. To put that in context, Israel's central bank has estimated that the entire war is going to cost $28.8 billion in direct military expenses. So America is footing the bill for half of everything that is going on right now. And the rest is happening through the um, infrastructure that the IDF has built up through continual US investment. Additionally, the two countries have strong economic ties. There's something like $80 billion a year in trade between them. A quarter of Israel's exports go to the US. Uh, so what I'm saying is America is super involved and has a ton of additional leverage. The US's hands are not tied, uh, it's not a third party mediator, it is fully involved in what is happening and without the full-throated diplomatic support and the arms that have gone to Israel, there simply would not be thousands of people dead right now. So civilians die in war, war is messy, what can you do? In the first six weeks or so, one in every 200 people was killed in the Gaza Strip. That is not normal. The rate of destruction and civilian deaths uh, is unprecedented in the 21st century. There's a lot of heavy words flying around in the headlines, but some of them carry more moral weight than they do specific meaning. 
And I think a set of words to keep an eye on is uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity. These words are used by human rights experts to indicate when there's been a violation of international humanitarian law. This is law that is a set of treaties that were mostly developed after World War II in response to the huge civilian toll of that war. Most of the world has ratified these agreements um, and they basically just say, uh, this is too horrible to do, even in a war, I will never ever do this, not even if someone does it to me first, it is never justified, signed USA, Israel, etc. This is helpful to keep in mind when there's people in the news or uh, government officials trying to justify why it is okay to do things that amount to war crimes. International respected human rights groups have accused both Israel and Hamas of committing a lot of war crimes. The siege, the bombing of hospitals and ambulances and mosques and schools and UN shelters and field hospitals and fishing boats and bakeries. These are all war crimes. Israel has defended itself by saying this protected civilian and humanitarian infrastructure was being used to do war, but in international humanitarian law, there are protocols for what you're supposed to do if you think that it's happening. Humanitarian observers and journalists don't have access to the territory right now, so they can't verify um, if that's happened. Uh, and just the scale of what's going on, it would be impossible to really have a clear idea of everything. Uh, but Amnesty International has managed to investigate a couple questionable bombings, and they have found them to be just as egregious as they appear. I don't think you should need to know that it's a war crime to drop two 2,000 pound bombs on a refugee camp uh, to know that it's not okay, <laughs> but if you feel a bit gaslit, it's helpful to know that that framework of international humanitarian law is there. And yes, two months ago, most of the world did ostensibly agree that these things are never justified. And you are definitely not a hateful or unreasonable person for wanting your government to not sponsor a bunch of war crimes. Finally, I just want to say, like, when people say ethnic cleansing and apartheid, I think there's a reflex to think that it's a metaphor or a rhetorical device, but I want you to maybe just imagine that, like, what if those are not metaphors and what if that is just the best description of what is happening? I'll include some links below to an action toolkit or something with ideas for how you can add your voice or talents or dollars to calls for a permanent ceasefire um, and steps toward like a durable, sustainable, just peace. I think to take seriously um, the right of safety and security of anyone in the region, even Israelis, is uh, to acknowledge that that seriousness can't be measured in tons of explosives and political solutions are necessary.